Welcome to a preview episode of the Back of the Envelope podcast. In this podcast, each episode will feature a guest who selects an estimation problem and then joins me in developing a solution to that problem. An estimation problem, sometimes called a back-of-the-envelope calculation, is an open-ended question that requires estimation to arrive at an order of magnitude estimate. The classic example of an estimation problem is, how many piano tuners are there in New York City? Since we're looking for an order of magnitude estimate, we're basically getting an idea of how many digits the answer has. So, does New York City have 20 piano tuners or 2,000 piano tuners? We don't really need to worry about splitting hairs between 2002 or 2005. Now, producing Back of the Envelope is going to require some additional effort on my part, which is why I've made this podcast the $60 a month goal on the Let's Code Physics Patreon, and we are already 18% of the way there. So if you like this episode and would like to see more of Back of the Envelope, please consider joining the Patreon as a supporter. Now with that business out of the way, let's welcome our first guest. Our inaugural guest is an AP physics teacher at Amador Valley High School in California and is active locally and nationally in the American Association of Physics Teachers. Bree Barnett-Dreyfus, welcome to the back of the envelope. Hi, thank you. Uh, So Bree, you've posed an interesting estimation problem for us to look at about a Coulomb cube. Uh, Could you describe what it is we're looking to calculate and what motivated you to investigate this problem? Mm-hmm. Well, I teach uh, conceptual physics as well as physics and AP physics over the last couple of years, and I found that my conceptual physics classes had a hard time visualizing what a coulomb was, not just how large the number was, but just the idea of why we were using it. So I used to make the analogy that it was like a dozen eggs. You would say you'd have one dozen eggs and everybody knew that you meant you had 12 and a coulomb was like that. And what was tricky for them was to figure out if I have one egg, how many of a dozen do I have? And I would say one twelve. So I usually try to solve my problems by building a thing that helps my students understand. And so I got it into my head that I was going to build a box that could hold a Coulomb's worth of something. So I was thinking about those chemistry cubes that will say one mole, and it will say if this was filled with oxygen, it would have this much mass. If this was filled with carbon, it would have this much mass. I thought I'm going to make one that I can fill with a Coulomb's worth of something. And so when I first started thinking about really small things that might fit in this box, I thought marbles, okay, that's too big went down to grains of rice that was too big and I finally settled on grains of sand and I didn't know what the volume was of a single grain of sand but it turns out a lot of mathematicians do because this is a common estimation problem. Very cool so if, if I understand it correctly another way of saying it is we want to fill up a box with sand and it's like we're taking away one electron from each grain of sand and we want to know how big the box has to be in order for it to all have one coulomb of charge. Is that another way of saying it? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So you mentioned this was specifically for your conceptual class. Do you find that your, your advanced class has the same problem or do they, do they, do they understand it better or do they just not care so much? I think they understand it a little bit better because they tend to come to me from chemistry. So they've already been introduced to the idea of mole, whereas my conceptual physics class tends to be students that are either freshmen or need additional help in science and may not be enrolled in a chemistry or physics class before they graduate. So this is the biggest number they've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And there isn't really an equivalent in the life science, I feel, that they have that idea from. Right, right. I mean, yeah, once you're in chemistry, obviously you get exposed to Avogadro's number a lot. Which mm-hmm. I, I'm still not sure I fathom how big that number <laughs> is, but at least I know that, you know, you start counting the digits instead of the the actual, you know, instead of keeping track of the numbers, you just keep track of how many digits the thing has, which is really what an estimation problem is, is where we care more about, you know, what the power is at the end rather than is it is it 900 or is it 901, you know. So to go through this calculation, what what do we need to start with in terms of the physics? Do you want to start with the charge? Do you want to start with the with the sand grains? What do you want to do? Well, my students were already introduced to the idea of charge before this, but we did problems like there's one extra electron, there's two, you know, very um, simple numbers. So they just get the idea that singles were were moving around of individual charge. But to do this, I actually asked them, what do you think? What kind of a small thing could we use to fill this box? And they inevitably say the same thing I did, which was sand. Mm -hmm. And so I asked them, in order to fit this many sand particles in there, what do I need to know about the sand? And so they'll say, oh, we need to know the volume. And so I found a couple of different estimates online that a cubic foot of sand would hold one billion grains. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But I did find a metric version from the math dude that said it would be 8 billion grains of sand per cubic meter, I believe. Mm -hmm. So 8 to the power of 9. And and uh, and I, I saw that blog article. We'll include that in the um, in the show notes. Um, how how does the the math dude arrive at at the what was it eighty eighty billion? Um, I've got eight million on here. Billion eight, on eight, here. Eight but billion. Excuse see. me. I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. switch my my spreadsheet to scientific notation. I probably should have done that already. Um, yeah, I would I always try to do the same. <laughs> Um, so looking at uh, his estimation, he was looking at the grains of sand there on the beaches. And so he had to start it down by looking at easier parts. And so he had to figure out first the volume for an individual um, beach that he had. And then from that, just an estimate for the individuals. And so there's a lot of conversions with these trying to figure out, well, how many fit in this size and how many fit in that size? Therefore, how many would fit in this larger volume? So there's also a lot of proportion, which can confuse the kids because they'll cross them with this with this math level that we had in conceptual physics. So he ended up getting about 15 to 25 grains per centimeter. Mm -hmm. But it also depends on the grain of sand that you have and the level of sand and the type of sand and how fine it was. And so a mm -hmm. lot of these were given as kind of an average. So that's why I had to estimate based on what I could find that was in metric units. Right. And I'm, I'm trying to think of the last time I looked at individual grains of sand because my my head is stuck in grains of rice, which you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, which have a little bit more of a of an oblong shape. I, I guess grains of sand are pretty. Uh, I, I guess they've got the same dimension, the, the, the same measurement in each dimension. Um, well, I you do have to assume that they're cubic. So there are every once in a while microscopic photos of sand that will get passed around along the lines of, you know, be inspired by the smallest things that you can't see. Look at how beautiful mm -hmm. the sand is under a microscope. And you can see that they're they're not uniform at all. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're, they're very different. So it does make an assumption that they are cubic. Right. And I did look at salt and sugar for this as well mm -hmm. to see if, because we know that those are fairly cubic. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot easier to fit in there. But the size was a little bit larger than the finest grains of sand that I could find mm -hmm. or find the values for. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So we're, so we're taking an average of about 20 uh, grains of sand per centimeter, like if you were to mm -hmm. line them up. So basically there's, uh, if, if, we take a, if we take a one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter box, then that's 20 grains by 20 grains by 20 grains. If we're mm -hmm. taking grain as a as a length measurement, and then we'll turn it into a volume measurement. So where do we go from there? So that would give you twenty by twenty by twenty, or eight thousand grains per cubic centimeter, and then that has to get converted to the number of grains that would be in a cubic meter. Which is, uh, I know my students' favorite conversion to forget about is um, <laughs> when, when, once you introduce a power on that unit, the unit conversion gets. A little bit, uh, a little bit different. I, I one time had my students draw. Um, this was this. This similarly was a conceptual physics course, so we tried to stay in um, imperial units as much as we could. So I'd have them draw one foot by one foot, and then divide each foot up into twelve inches. And I would say, okay, now count the squares on the board. And they would realize, oh, it's more than twelve squares. It's one hundred forty-four squares. So, um, so yeah. So that number of grains of sand is going to scale up dramatically when we get to the cubic meter so that's mm -hmm. that's where we get the the eight billion from it looks like um so where where do, where do we go next when we once we've got this eight billion grains of sand per cubic meter well from there since i wanted to make it into an amount that was equal to a coulomb so 6.25 times 10 to the 18th mm -hmm. i figured out if i take that number amount of um charges inside of a coulomb and divide it by the number of grains of sand in a cubic meter then that should give me the value of how many cubic meters it would be in a coulomb and this, for one coulomb. right and the and the 6.25 to 10 to the 18 that's that's like the the number of electrons you need to make a coulomb um and so that's if i understand correctly that's the inverse of what we usually present as the electron charge the 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 is that right Correct. And that's okay. one of the parts, like I mentioned, asking them how much was an egg in terms of dozens, and it's one twelfth. And so I show them if you take one and divide it by 6.25 times 10 to the 18th, you get the amount of charge in coulombs on a single electron. 
or 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of helps them to see that we're talking about this really big unit, but how much is one of them? And that's yeah. where those two numbers come into play. And I, and I try to do a little reading ahead of time. And it turns out if you Google, where did the Coulomb come from? It's got a bit of a messy history um, where it, it was named after Coulomb. Coulomb, I don't think proposed it, at least the, the references I found showed that, you know, Coulomb didn't necessarily propose this particular unit. It's basically defined in terms of the volts and the joule, because of we have a volt as a joule per coulomb, and so it's however much charge you need to get a uh, to get a, a joule of energy out of a volt of potential difference, um, and so it's actually it's kind of a messy unit uh, in that yes. sense. Yes, and unfortunately, it's just it's very common. And my students ask me, well, why do I have to count things in coulombs? Why can't I just tell you that I have three extra electrons or four? I say a lot of our problems, we're going to deal with them that way because it's easier for you to calculate. But in the real world, we don't usually give three or four extra electrons to something or take that many away. We're right. taking away a huge amount. So we have to have a unit that makes sense for the size we're actually moving to and from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I looked up to see if there were any other reference values. Um, the, the, the best ones I could find were when we do the little, um, you know, static electricity experiments you know you, you rub the balloon on your hair and, and stick it to the wall that it, that's usually a few micro coulombs and mm -hmm. that's that you know that's usually the first experiment we have them do the only thing that i could find that's actually on the order of uh, a few coulombs is a lightning bolt and that yes. can be anywhere from 10 to 300 coulombs it looks like so you know not the most pleasant example in the world but you know you can at least point to that and say that's a you know that's that's around 20 to to, some, to to a few hundred coulombs. Well, with the coulombs, it makes a lot more sense for them once we get to electric current, mm -hmm. because then we talk about an ampere being a coulomb per second. And so when we say one amp, you know, you're talking about how, how a coulomb's worth of charge went past you in a second. So we spend a little bit of time talking about shock and mm -hmm. what level of current we have to have to feel a shock and what level of current can kill us. And so then we usually go back and forth to the coulomb and say, okay, now we're talking about this many charges passing you by. That's the problem. It's the rate at which it's going through. Mm -hmm. So they get a bit more context once we get to the rate with the amperes, but it is a very large unit. There's not yeah. a lot of things, you're right, that are anywhere near a coulomb's worth of charge. Mm -hmm. Well, after that digression, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to resolving this calculation we're looking at. So we've got the, the, We've got this number that we need, uh, 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons for a coulomb. So that means we need 6.25 times 10 to the 18 grains of sand, right? We're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna uh, divide that into the yeah. So excuse me, we're gonna divide that by the 8 billion grains of sand per cubic meter. And what do we end up with at the end there for our volume of our coulomb cube? So for that one, we end up with 781 billion, 200 and, oh, sorry, 781 million, 250,000 cubic meters for a coulomb. And that's a lot. I mean, it is. I, 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 you know, we, we throw around cubic meters all the time in our physics classes, but if you take three meter sticks and lay them down at right angles, that's one cubic meter is, is a lot. <laughs> I actually have one better than that. Um, about 10 years ago, I built a PVC cubic meter. And oh, so nice. it, I build it down every year and then I build it back up. And as I'm talking about it with the students, I ask them, is a cubic meter the same as a cubic foot? And some of the younger ones that don't have as much ex exposure to the units are like, oh, yeah, it's about the same. It's a base unit. And then I stand in it and uh, show them the difference in an and I also made a cubic foot. And so then mm -hmm. I hold the cubic foot against it. And like you said, you have them divide up a, a cubic foot into 12 in, by 12. And I just move around the cubic foot within the cubic meter to show them how many. I say, well, how many cubic feet about fit into a cubic meter? And they usually ask, they say nine. I go, oh, no, yeah. no, no, no. Let's try that again. <laughs> and I actually have a record of fitting nine freshmen in a cubic meter. <laughs> It's like the uh, there was a there was a competition about that. I think when I was in college to fit the most college students in a phone booth. Yeah, it's similar. It's yeah, similar. Yeah, I mean we don't have phone booths anymore, so I guess they don't. I guess they don't do that competition anymore. No. So we've got just over seven hundred eighty million uh, 
cubic meters to fit a coulomb's worth of sand grains. Mm-hmm. Um, so what what did the dimensions of that box end up being if we make that a cube? So I cube rooted that and I got just about 921 meters on a side. That is a lot of meters. That's a lot of meters. So I for, tell the kids, I did not build you a coulomb sized box for grains of sand. No, for, for, our, for our American listeners, that is just over half a mile on each side. <laughs> we have a, a map of the local area that we use to talk about miles versus kilometers when we're talking mm-hmm. about length. And so we have a local grocery store that's just about a kilometer away. And so I tell them, all right, it's almost to Safeway. <laughs> and then go up about the same distance and then go over about the same distance. So some years I'll pull up Google Maps and actually trace out a section that's about a kilometer on yeah. each side from our school just to show them the footprint. And then think about it going up that high and they, their eyes get all big. And <clears throat> so it's fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to use Google Maps. Uh, I, I know it's a it's a spherical earth, so the math doesn't quite work out, but um the two major cities nearest us, uh, Tallahassee and Gainesville. If you draw a triangle between Tallahassee, Jacksonville, and Gainesville, it almost forms a right triangle. So mm-hmm. I, I use that as an example to say, you know, you're, you're not adding the distances together. You know, you're, you're doing this Pythagorean theorem thing because you know that driving from Jacksonville to Tallahassee is different from driving Jacksonville to Gainesville and Gainesville to Tallahassee. You're not just adding all the the total distance. You're 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 looking at the displacement from one to the other. Mm-hmm. It's always I love giving them a map because a lot of the freshmen in conceptual physics they're still walking to a lot of places. They haven't yes. gotten their cars yet, and so they have a little bit more of a sense of length that way. If you can give them some landmarks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that to get back to the Coulomb cube, that is a big box. I mean, yeah, that's that's yes. not something we're going to build as a demo. Um, I redid those calculations. Uh, I just copied and pasted them in my little spreadsheet here, and I just replaced the uh, the, the the width of the grain of sand with the width of a human hair. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you know, hair is much longer than it is wide, but maybe we chop it up into hair cubes or something like that. Who knows? Um, and that gets it down to about 333 meters on a side for the cube. So it's a third of a kilometer instead of an entire kilometer, but it's still enormous. You know, it's not really getting us another order of magnitude down to make it more manageable. Um, and I don't, I don't know of anything else we could try to fit into this box that you can see the individual particles of and still, you know, have it be manageable inside of a classroom size. And that's the problem. I mean, it gets right back to the mole cubes that they have in chemistry. On one hand, it helps the students see the difference between the masses for the same thing. But on the other hand, they can't see it. It's an empty cardboard box. Mm -hmm. And that number for the mole is just, it's, it's comparable in terms of it's very large number that students grapple with, but there's really nothing else that we can model it with other than gas particles. Right, right. I mean, even... Let me just Google really quick. Number of stars in Milky Way. I mean, it's, even it's more even, than the grains of sand. Yeah, I mean, even that is 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 two hundred and fifty billion. So, I mean, even that doesn't get up to the Avogadro's number or even this ten to the eighteenth size. Huh. Yeah, I but I guess I guess the moral of the story is it's very difficult to draw comparisons between the atomic and subatomic world and the world we live in. You know, it's just, it's, it's so much different in terms of scale. And it's hard for them to also convert at the same time to metric. And so that's right. the other thing I thought about going through and converting it to feet so that they could have some kind of sense of how that was. Cause even if you're talking about the height of it, that's difficult too. If you're saying, well, how big is, you know, our two story building? in terms of, of meters, because they can kind of estimate about 10 feet per story, but it's harder for them to figure that out when it comes to metric units. Right. So when we say it's gotta be almost a kilometer tall, you'd have to give an equivalent of how many stories is that in order to give them an idea. Right. Because looking up a picture of like the World Trade Center is not even quite 550 meters tall. Empire State Building is not even 500 meters tall. So they don't even know a tall building Right. That is tall enough to constitute the top of this this cube, but we would need. Right. So it looks like even the tallest skyscrapers in the world 
are not as tall as this box would have to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we we can get an idea of the of the distance in terms of length and width, but as soon as it becomes height, it's it's like a different thing in the human brain. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bree Barnett Dreyfus, for joining us on the back of the envelope. Uh, what would you like to give a shout out to while you're here? And uh, if people are interested in hearing more from you, where can they find you on social media? On social media, they can find me at my last name, at Barnett Dreyfus, one of the longest names in physics, I think. And I'm currently also involved in the Step Up Project with the APT and APS, trying to increase the number of women undergraduates in physics by sharing some lessons with physics teachers in high school, hoping that they can work with them with their students. And I will add a second to the Step Up program. I got to attend uh, your workshop at the uh, summer AAPT meeting recently about that. And I used the uh, one of the discussion activities in my class uh, last week, and it went really well. I was very happy with it. And so that was with college freshmen that you used the careers in physics one? Yes, they were a bit surprised to see uh, how closely they identified with uh, practicing physicists. That's good. That's what we're, we're seeing a bit of an expanse into the two-year college and four-year freshmen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really good that it, we're still seeing increases there. We don't have the same level of multi-year research as we do in the high school, mm -hmm. but we've really enjoyed seeing what the college professors have done with it as well. Yeah. Thank you again to Bree Barnett-Dreyfus for joining me. That's it for this episode. We'll see you next time on the Back of the Envelope. <laughs>